When David Bowie releases a new album, as he did this past week, it's a major event within the rock world. Bowie's influence has always been more inside than out. Only one of his 33 albums was a big commercial success. Most people know him from movie appearances or as a cult hero over the past 20 years. He invented heavy metal, new wave, and influenced the sound and the look of rock for more than a generation. But now, with his new record getting airplay and a 100-city, six-continent concert tour sponsored by Pepsi-Cola, Bowie may finally be moving into the mainstream of rock. And for him, that kind of fame could be a problem. His name originally was David Jones, an unlikely candidate for fame. A shy boy from a working-class family who dropped out of school when he was 16 to become a rock star. Now, at 40, he's a superstar whose new album puts his reputation as rock's legendary innovator and provocateur on the line. This is the was it all worth it question. Oh, no, you, you wouldn't do that You to strive me. for success since yeah. you're 16, you achieve success, yeah. and yeah. now you sit in your green chair yeah. looking yeah. back on it all, yeah. and what do you say? Not true. Uh, I didn't strive for success. I strive to do something artistically important. And success over here, I believe, is very much in, in the kind of material world. So can I just say that before we start? I wanted to do something artistically valid. How important is it uh, that the album be a, a big commercial success for you? Uh, not at all. I mean, I've only really experienced commercial success with Let's Dance. Um, and that came right out of the blue, completely. And uh, I don't ever expect it to happen again. I really, really no, not at all. I mean, he always wanted success. He always wanted it on his terms, which is more important, and still does. Uh, I must give him credit for not doing it anyone else's way but his own. Tony Visconti was part of Bowie's band through the late 60s and went on to produce 10 of his albums, including 1969's Space Oddity. Often thinks of it first. Doesn't do too well. I mean, he comes up with the formats. You know, he makes the new territory. And uh, others follow, but do it a little bit more slick, a bit more commercial. Well, like the Rolling Stones, who haven't sold nearly as many records as one might suspect, or Bob Dylan, uh, his, his influence has been on other artists. Rolling Stone Magazine's senior editor, Kurt Loder, has covered Bowie for 12 years. He affected schools of musicians and schools of fashions and styles. Style depended upon exaggerated characters, like Ziggy Stardust. The alienated characters that Bowie concocted have been copied so often, they've become a rock cliché. How calculated is any of this? That's bollocks. Uh, calculation, it's rubbish. I mean, it's no more calculated than any actor preparing and creating a part. It just happens that in the genre of rock, it's unusual for a rock artist to be kind of different off stage from what he's supposed to be on stage. But I just wanted to bring the, the idea of uh, performance and acting into rock. What Bowie created was rock theater. It wasn't just four guys with long hair and blue jeans playing loud music. He redefined what you could do on stage. Yet behind the innovative performance, as revealed in this 1975 documentary, was a young man so insecure that being himself just wasn't enough. I was never very confident of my voice, you see, as a singer. So I thought, rather than just sing them, which would probably bore the pants of everybody, I would, um, I'd like to kind of portray the songs. So he had to invent all these outrageous characters because he probably thought he was dead boring as a human being. He is pretty ordinary, you know. He's not outrageous. That's the, um, that's the sad thing about it. But he, he, can, he attracts outrageous people. And he, he does borrow from them. Angie! Darling, I came to say good luck. One of them was Angela Bowie, who spent the 10 years of their marriage as Bowie's unofficial manager and unpaid therapist. There's an awful lot of Rolls Royces out there, darling. Really? Limousines, incidents occurring. For a long time, he was always very reserved about letting people know what he really thought or what he really felt, because he was unsure of himself. You have to guess with David. It's all a question of guesswork. And I was probably one of the better guessers about him. Because he won't talk. He'll talk on stage and he'll talk in songs. But he won't talk the rest of the time. Now and then he did talk. Like the time he declared himself to be bisexual. But on stage, he hid behind a succession of outcasts. Each more confused, more bizarre, more fascinating to his fans. Why all these unhappy characters? Why these misfits? Spencer Tracy once said, Bob, I have no idea what he said. Um, that was good. Uh, <laughs> there was something, there was something coming there. He says something to the effect, actually, he did, that um, uh, uh, heroes are really boring. 
uh, the, the, the real interesting things are the, the, the off-center values of people, you know, and those are the things that trouble most people. And most of my characters have been sort of alienated, you know, and that's the one thing that people really think, am I, do I belong here? Who are my friends? You know, does anybody like me? All those things, you know, do, am I on my own? God, you know, it's, it's terrifying to be on your own in this world. And so those things all go into the porridge of other porridge. Were you <laughs> Did I say that? The, soup the porridge of what? Well, the soup of uh, of uh, it's one of the ingredients of, of what my characters represent. Well, if if as you well, see, are you going to buy that? Well, yeah, I, I do buy that. And in fact, right. if you if you do buy that, then yeah. one can only assume that you you have an awful lot of this or had an awful lot of this going around in your head. Oh no, my life's a, just a joyride, man. Yeah, I just see it. Sure. It's on the streets out there. I just pick up and put it. <laughs> of course I do. Yeah, I mean everybody. Um, drinks the goldfish bowl water and lies under furniture and things, yeah. don't you? By his own admission, Bowie became offstage what he was on stage: the self-centered, drugged out, paranoid rock star. The conflict was part of his life for years. Yeah, I had a lot of problems with that. Well, what I did to get out of that situation where characters were me and I was the character and they'd go, Bleh. Yeah. I went to uh, Berlin and I really adjusted to the idea that it's very easy to just throw it all away. Um, and tried to come out of that. Even though when they came out, the Berlin albums were a critical and commercial failure, they're now considered his most significant work. Bowie's personal anguish had coincided with an artistic achievement that again was ahead of its time. Can you be sure that you're not going to go back into that trap? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. I mean, one always has lapses, you know, and you feel despondent about things and maybe, you know, slightly sad. But then you get all ever so cheerful again. In 1983, Bowie finally had his first real commercial success with the album Let's Dance. It was good time disco music that some of his fans and friends said was only that. I view his period of um, doing Let's Dance and all that as a, as a trying to cash in on his own ideas. But I think he went too far the other way. I think it was a little too mundane. Bowie describes his new album as a collection of different styles drawn from the past and for someone who's built a career keeping one foot in the future, that's a radical departure. I know it must be difficult to get out of bed every morning and say, oh God, I'm David Bowie, I gotta do something different. He could genuinely be fed up with it. But for a man who's innovated all, all these wonderful things all these years, he's really, I hate to say it, sold out. You always have that that uh, segment of people who are with you from the start, yeah, and it's yeah. like, oh Bowie, you know, he's sold out. I don't begrudge any artist for getting an audience. I'm sorry, I never found that poverty meant purity. That's rubbish. For a guy who doesn't like to play it safe, though, as the audience gets larger, it must be harder to take those chances. Well, I think if I were sort of a more cautious person, it would, uh, it would be difficult and a bit sort of claustrophobic because I would now feel that I shouldn't do things that were maybe quite as artistically dangerous or off the wall as I would have done before. But actually, I find it quite... I feel a bit naughty about it because it means that I can do really what I want to do to a large audience. In the vanguard of things for a long time, it's hard to know where the vanguard might lie right now. I mean, I think once again, as he has throughout his whole career, he reflects what's going on now, which is a sort of confusion, sort of times of diminished expectations in a lot of ways. So you do tend to look back to this stuff that was so great, and if you listen to it again, it still is great. It's tempting to say maybe his glory days are over, he's no longer in the vanguard, but, you know, if he never did another thing, he deserved to be up there at the top. Whether he'll do more in the future, you know, it depends on the context of the times, probably.